السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين. My dear brothers and sisters and guests, we begin as always by thanking and praising the one who created the heavens and the earth. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also to send his peace and blessings upon the messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Tonight, we have a lecture by our dear brother Bilal Asad, and he will be addressing the topic of Muhammad وسلم, and his compassion to the world, to mankind. He will be talking about the greatest man who walked upon this earth, the man that you and I need to take as an example. We need to know about him and we need to follow in his footsteps. The man whom Allah said about him, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ And we did not send you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, except as a mercy. Alameen means all of Allah's creation. Not just Muslims, non-Muslims, animals, plants. He is a mercy to all of creation. So we ask our dear brother Bilal to come forward and present the compassion of Muhammad to the world. Which is Akalaw Khair. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم انفعنا بما علمتنا وجعلنا للمتقين إماما My brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to benefit us with what we are about to listen to today and to make us a guide for those who come after us, to our friends, to our family, and to all of those, whether they ask or don't ask about Islam, to make us a tool in spreading this wonderful, wonderful message. Tonight, my dear brothers and sisters, I will attempt to share with you a night of peace and tranquility together. And I intend to talk about the compassion and mercy of our beloved Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam not only to mankind as the topic suggested mankind the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa did not only come as a compassion and mercy to only mankind he came as a compassion and mercy to the whole world to everyone and to everything and the way that I intend to present this is by going back and showing you some stories or examples of the Prophet Sallallahu and the way that how he was compassionate towards the different beings in his life. How he showed his compassion towards all creatures, human beings, even the jinns, the Muslims and the non-Muslims, the women and children, his wives, his sons and daughters, and the sons and daughters of all the other believers the poor and the old, the sick and the sad, the animals and the insects even. How he showed his compassion even towards enemies of Islam, how he treated them, and how he treated women in general. 
And finally, I will conclude insha'Allah with the question, why do we love Muhammad sallallahu so much? Why? That's towards the end insha'Allah. My brothers and sisters in Islam, the reason why I chose this topic is basically because this miraculous man, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, of whom many historians and orientalists, Muslims and non-Muslims, have praised him so much, past and present, and ranked him as the highest, most influential and successful man ever to walk on the face of the earth. Such a man, how can I go, how can any of us go without defending him and speaking the truth about him and about his examples and his parables? How can one pass by such a great man and not mention his qualities and characteristics if anybody knows this man Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and does not inform about him in the correct way and the authentic manner then such a person is an evil human being because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to share the mercy with all the human beings and all the creatures and you will be restricting that we are not a selfish people the author of a book called The 100 a ranking of the most influential persons in history this author's name is Michael Hart I think you may have heard of him he says my choice of Muhammad وسلم, to lead the list of the world's most influential persons may surprise some readers and may be questioned by others but he was the only man in history who was supremely successful on both the religious and secular level this is a non-Muslim man talking about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam this way my dear brothers and sisters from here I would like to mention that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam peace of Allah and his blessings be upon him said to his companions بَلِّغُوا anni walaw ayah." inform about me even if you only know one parable so if we know about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam parable wallahi can change people and from here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an which everyone can read about the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam بَعْدَ أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ And we have not sent you a Messenger of Allah for any other reason except to be a mercy to the whole world except to be a mercy to the whole world everyone Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also tells us about the qualities of this great messenger Muhammad sallallahu by saying لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِّنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا عَنِتُّمْ عزيز عليه ما عنتم حريص عليكم بالمؤمنين رؤوف رحيم which means there has certainly come to you a messenger from among yourselves grievous and hurtful to him it is when you suffer when we suffer the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم gets hurt and he feels pain for our suffering eagerly concerned over us in guidance compassionate and merciful to the believers this is the type of messenger and prophet that we are talking about my brothers and sisters in Islam every prophet that came to their people we do not neglect their compassion which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought them with too we do not neglect the compassion of Isa alayhi salam, Jesus Christ, the son of Mary. Nor do we neglect the compassion of Musa or Abraham or all the other prophets, Dawood, known as David, or Sulaiman alayhi salam, and the rest of the other prophets. For all the prophets of Allah, they are a mercy to the people. And they are a compassion to all the people. For it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we heard yesterday's talk 
by our brother, the brother Abu Hamza, how he was talking about the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no one more merciful than Allah. So how can he send someone who is not also merciful and compassionate? How? So we are talking about people who are sent from Allah the most merciful with a message and a guidance for all of mankind and all of the jinns, all the people of the world. The Prophet ﷺ used to address his companions first of all in the most beloved fashion and the most honorable way. In fact, he used to treat every individual as if he or she were the most favorable in his eyes. So every single companion used to think that they are the most beloved, most favored by this Messenger Wasallam. If you met him, you will think that Muhammad Wasallam loves you the most. Because of the way he used to treat every person, individually, with sensitivity. And he used to analyze what is sensitive to you. And avoid it. Until you would think that he loves you the most. Every single companion thought they were the most beloved. And this way the Prophet ﷺ kept the unity of his companions. And abolished, uh, abolished the jealousy and the hatred and the envy that could exist between them. So each one of them was a special character for him. And this is the way the Prophet ﷺ teaches us to deal towards one another ourselves. And towards our children. Not to try and show the favorism of one to another. So he used to say to them all, I am to you like a person who is trying to keep away butterflies from burning in a blazing flame. So he tries to keep away the butterflies from burning in the blazing flame and they just keep wanting to come and throw themselves in the blazing flame because it looks attractive to them. This is how the Prophet Sallallahu used to teach us and his companions how he is to us. He said, I am like one who is guarding you from the flame. I am the one who is guarding you from the fire because it's too attractive and I'm leading you away from it because it can harm you and directing you to the great salvation. Nothing different to what the other prophets came before him said. For he, they are all the messengers of Allah and the messenger of Allah is one. Allah means God, by the way. The companions used to say to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam O Messenger of Allah When we are with you When we are with you We feel as if there are angels surrounding us And we are about to be literally risen from the earth and placed into Jannah, in paradise We're about to flutter above the earth and go right to the heavens But when we depart from your company, O Messenger of God We feel empty We feel empty as if all goodness has abandoned us as well. The Prophet wasallam said to them, My companions, it is because you are with the Messenger of God, whom God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, has sent him with great mercy to all of the people. Why will you not feel such a thing when you are around me? Learn from it. My dear brothers and sisters, the Prophet wasallam, he sacrificed his blood and his wealth and his time for our sake in order to save us in a time where kufr like disbelief took the Prophet ﷺ and his followers as the greatest enemies and wanted to persecute them and drive them out of their homes and torture them and punish them and strip them from all wealth and all possessions and disunite between them only because they said we worship one God and they called to it those people of the kuffar at that time the enemies who hated this call they didn't want this to spread so they began disuniting between every person who says God is only one the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never lifted a sword at anybody or forced them to enter into Islam he never forced anyone to embrace this religion because a person who was to become a Muslim must become a sincere Muslim from the heart. Otherwise, they are not accepted by Allah as Muslims. You have to be sincere and accept it full-heartedly. 
For 14 whole years, the Prophet ﷺ only invited the people. Never lifted a finger or a sword to fight anyone. Yet they persecuted him and his people and his followers. He had to keep it a secret in the beginning, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he began his message, brothers and sisters. The first people whom he began with were his family. So he called his uncles. And he called his, his uh, first cousins and his tribe. And he stood before them after 40 years of knowing him to be a truthful prophet. And said to them, O oh my people, if I were to tell you that an army is about to approach you and attack you from behind those mountains now, Will you believe me? They all said with one voice, We have never known you to be a liar, O Messenger, o, o Muhammad. You are a noble man who has always been truthful and honest. We believe you. He said, Well then I have come to you to warn you from falling into hellfire and that God has sent me as a messenger for you to abandon the worship of idols which you carve with your hands and to worship the creator of everything. Say, La ilaha illallah tuflihu. Say, There is only one God. And you will be successful. As soon as he said that word, the first one was his uncle, Abu Lahab. He stood up and he said, Tabbalak! It's like he swore at him. At him. Tabbalak! Is this what you, what you came and gathered us for? If you asked us for a thousand words other than that, we will respond, but this word never. You're asking us to leave and abandon the, our ancestral belief. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa replied, I am but a warner to you. Another person then replied and said, Go away, O oh person, you've gone crazy it seems. And the people began one after the other insulting the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam except for one person he accepted. And that even made the matter worse because that one person that accepted was a young boy at the age of only seven, between seven or ten years old. His name was Ali radiallahu anhu. He said, I believe what you said, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the people began to laugh. <laughs> Look, a young, only a young boy accepted what he said. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa then said, I say one final word to you. I am but like a warner, warning messenger who has come to warn you of a coming army that is about to attack you and kill you. And I am trying to save you from that. And then he walked away sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But he didn't give up for 14 whole years after that, as I said, continued trying to save these people from hellfire, trying to save them from a fabricated religion which their ancestors brought them with based on culture. And this culture, my dear brothers and sisters, was full of oppression, injustice. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was so kind and compassionate to all the people that met him that the people of Quraysh who didn't want anyone to become a Muslim they were so afraid that anybody would even lay eyes on the Prophet ﷺ, or even hear a single word that they used to say to, him, to them do not approach this man for he has words of sorcery if you listen to him you'll become magnetized and hypnotized but as soon as one person sat with him, one word made these people, these companions say to the Messenger Sallallahu a common motto. Do you know what that was? They used to say, as soon as they sat with him for a few minutes, Bi Abi anta wa ummi ya Rasulullah. O Messenger of God, I am ready to sacrifice everything I have in your cause before even my father and mother. That was their common motto. Who can say that to someone? Who can now here sit here and say to some Beloved person of yours, say to them, I am ready to sacrifice everything I have, my blood, my wealth, my honor, everything, in your cause, even before my mother and father. Who can say that to anyone else? Who? There is no one. There is no one more valuable than your mother and father, except the Prophet ﷺ and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They used to say to him with only a few minutes, Bi Abi anta wa ummi ya Rasulullah. Fidaka abi wa ummi ya Rasulullah. I sacrifice everything in your cause before my mum and dad, O Messenger of God. Why? Were they crazy people? Were they insane? La wallah. They were leaders. They were people who understood very well. They were linguisticians who understood language very well. And they could easily differentiate between words of the Quran and the words of poetry or the words of magic, or whatever it was. Are the billions of Muslims today all crazy and insane? There has to be a secret. 
The companions of the Prophet ﷺ felt the love of their messenger so much so that the Prophet peace be upon him when he was forced into battle like in a war battle the companions used to say فَإِذَا حَمِيَ الْوَطِيسِ كُنَّا نَخْتَبِئُ بِرَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ When the war became too intense for us and we couldn't charge anymore we used to go and run and hide behind the Prophet's back and he used to defend us Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam In the battle of Hunayn, another fierce battle the Muslims were almost about to lose and they were running away then the Messenger Sallallahu said Oh my companions, servants of Allah come, come and seek refuge behind me I will defend you Who of us is ready to do that? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi is ready to die in defense of his companions and he said Allah will not lose us Nobody can ever, ever equal the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his compassion towards us. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's compassion to the humans in general. I'm going to give you some examples of how he was to the humans in general. Muslim, non-Muslim, anyone. As we said, his main aim was to invite the people and call them from falling into disaster. In this world and in the hereafter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had commanded him that he must go out and invite the people and call them to worship one God and to save them with sincerity from hellfire because neither God nor his prophets want anyone to be burnt in hellfire not one of them so the Prophet sallallahu after he called the people of Mecca Allah ordered him to go outside of Mecca and call another people the following story my brothers and sisters Wallahi, I've read it many times. It always brings tears to my eyes when I remember my beloved Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This place which he had gone to was a Ta'if. It's a common place known in Saudi Arabia today. At that time, they were full of people who worshipped idols and were non-believers. It's about 60 kilometers away from Mecca. So he went on that journey with his freed slave. Like he had a slave whom he bought and then freed him. That was a common practice of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he ordered and advised his companions to do the same thing: buy slaves and free them. So he freed his slave named Zaid ibn Harith, and they went out to a Ta'if. As soon as he arrived to a Ta'if, he spoke with the first man he saw and said, with the most greatest wisdom of words and the kindest manner, the Prophet ﷺ used to approach them and say, I am a messenger of God and God has brought the Qur'an to you and used to recite the Qur'an to them to prove to them how this is not words of man and then he would advise them and tell them the commandments and the prohibitions and the wisdoms which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought to him. The first man scorned him and said, away from me, O crazy man. So he went to another man, a leader of this, and he said to him, couldn't God have sent any other messenger than you? And then another man said to him, he said, if you truly are a prophet, then I am not worthy of listening to you. And if you are not a prophet, then you're a liar. Get away from you, insignificant man. Scorns after scorns, until finally he stayed there for more than seven nights, ten days, more than ten days, calling the people and trying to address them. Wallahi, with his full heart, trying to save them. So they got sick of him. Not one of them responded, not one. They got so sick of him that they wanted to exile him and throw him out. He was an unwel unwelcome guest. So they brought the children, young boys and girls. And they brought the women behind the boys and girls. And then the men, the slaves and the servants behind the women. And then their leaders stood even behind them watching and laughing as they subjected the Prophet ﷺ to a narrow path. Imagine now a line on this side and a line on this side. Boys and girls, women at the back, servants and peasants on the other side, and they're all throwing rocks at you, spitting at you, throwing dirty material, filthy, impure things at your face, at your, at your legs, and, and swearing at you in a land which is so strange to you, and you don't know anyone there. And you've come to them with a true message, all you're doing is just inviting and saying pure words of kindness and you haven't harmed anyone and this is the way you've been treated the Prophet Sallallahu with Zayd walking between these two lines they threw the filth at him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam until his legs began to bleed on both sides and Zayd ibn Harith tried to protect him and he was injured in his head and the blood was seeping from him 
subjecting him to a few kilometers down, almost about two kilometers. All on his side, children, women spitting at him, cursing him, abusing him, laughing at him, pointing at him. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, almost a 42 or 43 year old man. Until finally, at that time, very tired and exhausted, he sought refuge in one of the numerous gardens. He sat tired beneath one of the trees of the gardens. And the people left him. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent two sons of Rabi'ah. And they felt a bit of remorse for this man. So they said to their servant, they had a slave, a Christian slave. And his name was Addas. Said, go and take this tray of grapes to that man. We feel sorry for him. So Addas, the Christian slave, went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he gave him the grapes. Then the Prophet ﷺ said some words which shocked Addas. He said, Bismillah. Because when we eat, we say Bismillah. In the name of God. The man Addas looked at him peculiarly and said, Where did you learn these words? These words are not common to the people of this land. I've never heard them before. The Prophet ﷺ looked at him with a smile. Because that's his character. Even though he was treated so badly by all the people of the city, Listen to this carefully, brothers and sisters. I have a very important message here. He never ever generalized. Every single individual was a potential Muslim and a potential good person. He looked at Addas and smiled. And he asked him, O oh, oh person, where are you from? And Addas said to him, I am from a place called Ninawa. The Prophet ﷺ said, Ninawa, the place where Yunus ibn Matta is from? Jonah. Addas looked at him and said, asked, how do, you know Adda, how do you know Yunus, Jonah? Tell me about Jonah. Who was mentioned in the Bible. The Prophet peace be upon him then said, Jonah is my brother, meaning his brother in prophethood. And he is a prophet of God. And I am also a prophet of God. As soon as he said that, Addas began to kiss his forehead and his hands and his legs. And he began to cry. The his leaders who were looking at him, they raced, raced after him and said to him, Addas, come back here, come back, what are you doing? They brought him back and they said to him, don't follow him, your religion is better than his religion. Don't get stunned by him. And Addas looked at him, at them with crying face and he said to them, Wallahi, by God, because that's what they used to say. No man knows what this man knows about Jonah except for another prophet. At that moment, my dear brothers and sisters, the Prophet ﷺ said his famous dua, which is so emotional and preserved till today. An encounter of how the Prophet ﷺ expressed his distressed soul to us. He lifted his arms up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's what every Muslim does, brothers and sisters. When you are in stress, when you are in despair, when you are in loss of hope, say, Ya Allah, turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he said, Ya Allah, O oh Allah, ila man tatrukan. Sorry, he said, Allahumma, to you alone I complain of my weakness, my insufficient ability, and my insignificance in the eyes of the people. You are the most merciful of all mercifuls. You are the Lord of the helpless and the weak. O oh my Lord, into whose hands would you abandon me to? Into the hands of an unsympathetic, distant relative who will angrily frown at me or to the enemy to have control over my life? O oh my Lord, but if you are not angry with me, then all of this does no, no longer matters to me. All of it doesn't concern me. Your pardon is ample enough for me. I seek the protection in the light of your face, which illuminates the darkness. May it never be that I should ever earn your anger or that you should ever become angry at me. And there is no, no power or resource except with you, O oh Allah. When all else fails, my brothers and sisters, your companion is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi complained to him. And do you know what happened? On his way, Jibreel alayhi salam, the angel Gabriel came down. He said, I, I felt like a cloud was above me. I looked above me, it was Jibreel, he had come down. And he said to me, I have with me the angel of the mountains. 
If you want, you can talk to him. Then the angel of the mountain said, O messenger of God, we know your distressed state and we know how these people have treated you. If you want me, I will crush them between the two mountains, al akhshabain that was surrounding at taif I will crush them and destroy them. Just say the word. Now what would one of us do, brothers and sisters, in this situation? At least we want some revenge. Do you know what the Prophet ﷺ said? You see, it's in his nature to be compassionate. He said, La, no. For maybe Allah will bring out from their, pro- from their progeny, from their loins, from their children, later on in the future sometime, maybe, in the future they will have children who will believe in the one true God, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do not destroy them. If they cannot be saved, then maybe their children will be saved. What is the Prophet ﷺ going to get out of it when he is dead? For those people who say, this man who came, there was something that he wanted out of it. He wanted fortune or fame. But after his death, why would he want fortune or fame? To worship one God? So what? Because the Prophet ﷺ is a mercy to mankind. When we speak about the Prophet's generosity, Wallahi, we cannot go beyond his generosity and no one can ever resemble him or equal him in that. He would never eat better food until he was sure that his people have eaten already. And sometimes there will be three whole months that would pass by the Prophet's family household and no meat will be eaten. Three months. Because the Prophet said, if he wanted, he could be rich. But every time he sought richness, every time he had some wealth, he had some possession, there was always someone in need and he would distribute it. In fact, he would do it so much, the Prophet that one time he was standing up of many times and he was distributing from his wealth and his possessions to the needy and the poor. And he was calling out, oh hungry people, come to me. Oh poor people, come to me. Take from this, take from that. Because the Prophet teaches us that from our wealth and from our possessions, There are some of them that do not belong to us. They belong to the poor people. Because they belong first of all to Allah and He says, part of your wealth belongs to the poor people. The Messenger the example for us, calling them to Him. And right at the end, after He depleted everything He had, a Badawan man came along. And Badawans at those days were very harsh people. And they were very rude. And not very intelligent either. So he came up to Muhammad from behind the people and grabbed the Prophet from his collar. And he pulled him vigorously down towards him until he made the Prophet's neck have a streak of blood around his neck. That's how hard he pulled him. The Prophet was in pain. So what he did was, he didn't push him off. He didn't beat him up. He didn't kick him off. He leaned towards him only to ease the pain on his neck. And the better one said to him, Malik, Give me from your wealth. Give me. The Prophet could have said to him, why should I give you? The Prophet said to him, I don't, have in, I don't have any more to give. The man said, by Allah you will give me from your wealth. He thought he was lying. So the Prophet said, wait for me. After the people departed, he took his hand and he took him to his own house. Fed him. Sheltered him. Comforted him. And gave him a place to sleep for three days and three nights at his own house and fed him from what he feeds from his family. Whatever he had. At the end of the three days, the Badawan stood up and he realized his mistake. He ended up loving this compassionate Prophet ﷺ so much that he called the people and he said, Behold everyone, Allah. Or Allah means behold in Arabic. It's when you want people's attention. Allah. Allahumma arhamni warham Muhammadan wa la tarham ahadan ma'ana. Oh Allah. Have mercy on me and mercy on Muhammad, but don't have mercy on anyone else. This is the only one that was good to me. <laughs> the Prophet ﷺ didn't stop there. He brought him up and he said to him secretly and quietly, not to sort of insult him. He said to him, no, Allah's mercy is great and encompasses all people. So then the battle one nodded his head and he got up and he said, Allahumma arhamni warham Muhammadan warham al-alamina ajma'in. Oh Allah, give mercy to me and Muhammad and give mercy to all of the people. 
Prophet ﷺ, this is what he taught his people to say and do. The Prophet ﷺ, when we look at the example of how we treated the old people and the weak people, Wallahi, our minds cannot grasp it. And we just want to see his face and kiss it night and day, night and day, night and day. SubhanAllah. The Prophet ﷺ, once he saw an old woman, and you might know this story. He didn't ask about her religion or what she followed or where she came from. This, this, this is not important to the Muslims. Because when you're sincere, it doesn't matter what color you are, what nationality you are, what uh, status you come from, what religion you are. Good service is good service. So Prophet ﷺ saw this old woman, she had no one beside her to help and she was trying to lift some luggage up onto her satchel, onto her camel and trying to go home. When the Prophet ﷺ saw her, he immediately raced to help her. He carried them on top and helped her and dragged the camel along and helped the old woman and kept her company all the way until she reached her home, put her luggage down, made her comfortable and made sure that everything has been given to her. So then she looked at him and said to him, Oh young man, your face is full of light and your words are full of comfort. You bring softness to my heart and you are one of the best people I've ever met. I thank you for this company, how can I ever repay you? The only thing I have is not wealth or money or possessions, but I have an advice for you. In those days, advices used to be bought for the price of camels in those days, like a price of car today. So he said, yes, advise me. Prophet Azam used to accept advices from old women. So he said to him, she said to him, there is a man, his name is Muhammad, and he's a very bad man. He has disunited the people and disunited us from our family. He teaches people sorcery and he leads them astray from the ancestral belief. Keep away from him. I don't want you to be destroyed. You are too, too good of a man. <laughs> so then, wallahi, this is a true story, ya akhwan. True story. And she said, that, then finally she asked him for his name. And the Prophet ﷺ is patient and calm. What would one of us do? <laughs> he turned around and smiled and said, My name is Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam <gasps> She said Muhammad Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam She could not do anything except Sit down on her knees and say Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa annaka rasulullah I bear witness that there is only one God And you are his messenger Because only a messenger can be this way Only a messenger can be this way Brothers and sisters Our da'wah doesn't have to be given with our tongues All the time Some of us are not good with our tongues but maybe in our character and attitude, which we lack so much today. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. The Prophet ﷺ was in the service of all weak people. One time, a man from Quraysh, a non-Muslim, he approached the people and said to them, Abu Jahl, he used to call him Abu al-Hakam, he was one of the greatest leaders of the Quraysh. Everyone feared him. He was a big and strong man, very wealthy, a leader. And he was one of the greatest enemies to the Prophet ﷺ. He said to the people, excuse me, I'm not from this land. This man, Abu al-Hakam, who was really Abu al-Jahl, the father of ignorance. I've loaned him money a long time ago and they are due to be given back to me. I'm a poor man and weak. Can anyone help me get my money back from him? So then they looked at each other and they thought, let's have a bit of a laugh. They looked at the Prophet ﷺ. He was praying near the Kaaba and they said to him, see that man over there? They said, yes. They said, go to him, ask him to get you your money. He can do something about it. So he went to the Prophet ﷺ and said to him, Excuse me, I've been told by these people that you can get my money back from this man. He's taken my money and my children are going to die of hunger. The Prophet ﷺ said, Yes, I can help you. Subhanallah. Abu Jahl, he was the one who wanted to kill the Prophet ﷺ. The leader, paying money to assassinate the messenger ﷺ, he went and knocked on his door. As soon as Abu Jahl opened the door, he gave him the money. And the Prophet ﷺ went back and said, This is your money. He said, thank you very much. The people who were looking at him were flabbergasted. They said, how did you do that? So they went to Abu Jahl. Yeah, Abu Jahl, what's going on here? Why did you give him the money? This was your opportunity to kill him. He said, afu anni. Like this is what he saying in Lebanese. Afu anni. Like, ilaykum anni. In Arabic. Keep away from me. Wallahi, when he opened the door, I could see two wild male camels behind him. They're about to attack me and rip me apart. <laughs> Naam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He is the one who showed that image to Abu Jahl Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects those Who stand alongside Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Do we stand along his side truly brothers and sisters? When one sees the way the Prophet used to treat the slaves and the captives Again You will become speechless The Prophet did not leave anyone Outside of his compassion and mercy Here is Bilal radiallahu anhu And I am so proud to be named after Bilal 
an Ethiopian slave who used to exist at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Insignificant man, meaning towards the tribes. And he was a slave with Umayyah. Umayyah la'natullahi alayhi. Bilal radiallahu anhu, when he embraced Islam in secret, Umayyah found out his, his Lord, the one who bought him, the one who had him and owned him. And he said, I own your soul, I own your wealth, I own everything that you say. You're not allowed to become a Muslim. He said, there is only one God. So Umayyah brought him in the scorching sand and placed him in the middle of the desert and placed a stone over his chest. Brothers and sisters, the sand over there in Saudi Arabia, in Mecca, the sand is more than 60 degrees Celsius. It'll burn you back easily. It'll peel off your skin. And then with a, with a stone so heavy, so large that needs four men to carry it, was placed on his chest and then he was whipped, saying, Say that our, our idols are the best. And he would say, Ahadun Ahad, Ahadun Ahad. There's only one God. There's only one God. Suddenly, as he was almost about to kill, kill Bilal radiallahu anhu, a man by the name of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, Habibi Abu Bakr, he arrived and he said, The messenger has sent me, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I will buy this man off you, ya Umayyah. How much do you want for him? Name the price. And Umayyah said to him, he said, I'll give him a bit of a high price. He said, I want 10 golden dinars. Everyone laughed around him. Suddenly he threw the sack in front of him. 10 golden dinars. Umayyah looked up and he said, What a fool you are. You think that you've accomplished something here? I would have asked 2 dinars for this worthless person. He's worth nothing. You just bought a worthless person for 10 dinars. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu said, The Messenger sallam said, or Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu himself said, who was being taught by the Messenger sallam, I would have paid 100 dinars for him. I would have paid a hundred. And Umayyah was darkened in his face and thought, damn, I could have made another 90 golden dinars. <laughs> slaves are valuable in Islam. And the first people who followed the Prophet ﷺ were the slaves and servants and the weak. Then the leaders followed, such as Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, Abu Ubaid ibn Jarrah, Umar radiallahu anhu and the rest. The Prophet ﷺ used to promise great rewards in paradise for people who bought slaves and set them free. Or bought women slaves and set them free and then had the choice of marrying them or letting them free. The Prophet ﷺ used to say, Wail, meaning a place in hellfire. Wail to those who harm their servants. Hit them, bash them. And he said, every servant must be fed from the food that you feed your family with. Must be given shelter and comfort. Must be allowed to do these things. So much so that one time Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu. Abu Dhar made a mistake one time. His servant, he had a servant. And he did something wrong. So Abu Dhar slapped him across the face. Suddenly Abu Dhar heard a voice from behind him. A voice saying to him, Ala tattaqi nara bihada da'if. Do you not fear the hellfire because of this weak person in front of you? Abu Dhar looked back, wanting to answer back, and the Prophet ﷺ said to him, and he found the Prophet ﷺ before him. It was the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he said to him, Ya Rasulullah, he is for free for the sake of Allah. I, I've set him free. The Prophet ﷺ said, if you did not set him free, Allah would have punished you in the fire. Subhanallah. Which religion in the world or ideology or, or, or system? I ask you in the name of Allah. Which system in the world has this mercy and its sensitivity to even the slaves like that? Who? Which, which religion? Not one. Islam honored them and lifted them until Bira radiallahu anhu was the caller to the adhan which we call today. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was even compassionate towards the animals and the insects. One time... They were out towards a battle. Suddenly the Prophet ﷺ stopped the whole army. And he said, there is a bird above me fluttering. Why is the bird fluttering above you, Ya Rasulullah? He said, she is crying because someone has taken her babies from its nest. Who took them? And a young man came along and said, Ya Rasulullah, I did. The Prophet ﷺ said, why? Why do you want to hurt the feelings of this mother by taking her children? Return them back. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ used to say, anyone who, ha who kills a bird for no reason, on the day of judgment it will come to Allah crying and saying, my Lord, your servant so-and-so killed me and he had no reason for killing me. Now, which... 
The Prophet Sallallahu The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam forbid the killing of animals and insects without a reason and he specialized the ants and the bees because they are mentioned in the Quran. He also specialized the woodpecker because it is also mentioned in the Quran. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also specialized the frog because we have a story about the frog when Ibrahim, our Prophet Ibrahim Alaihi was thrown into the fire by his people. The frog, what can a frog do? If it comes close to the fire, it'll, if its skin dries up, it's dead. It has to always be moist. So from the pond, it tried to hop as close as it can to a fire that's six stories high. It would get water from the pond and just spit it out, trying to extinguish the fire. Because of that, yes brothers and sisters, the frog can't do that. But this is a lesson to us Muslims, that you are to do what is within your ability, even if it cannot benefit. Do within your ability. Allah does not tell you to do things that are beyond your ability. So here is the frog. And because it did that, even though it did nothing, Allah forbid the killing of any frog for any reason until the end of time. Abadan. If I find the frog in my bed, in my pillow, in my mouth, Allah, I wouldn't kill it. Now, I just remembered my sister-in-law. I think she is amongst us. Now, the reason why I remember it is because she's so passionate towards animals' rights. But she eats a lot of uh, beef and lamb as well. So I don't know where they came from. <laughs> the Prophet wasallam was so compassionate even to the non-Muslim enemies and their children. Here's an important point for me which I would like to discuss with you. We've already heard some examples about how the Prophet wasallam dealt with a non-Muslim old lady. That's by default. Well, what about every other non-Muslim enemy, friend or foe? Allah says in the Quran, "La ikraha fi din." There is no compulsion in religion. So, Prophet Sallallahu could not compel anyone. Also, Allah also says, "Inna ma anta munzir." You are only but a warner. That's all you can do, a messenger of God. Allah also says to him. فَذَكِّرْ إِن نَفَعَتِ الذِّكْرَى سَيَذَّكَّرُ مَنْ يَخْشَى He said, remind, if the remindance will benefit, those who want to accept, those whose hearts are open, they will accept. Allah also says in the Qur'an to the Prophet Wasallam, لَسْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ بِمُسَيْطِرٍ You are not allowed to force them or compel them. So, where did people get the notion that Muslims were commanded or oh, Islam was spread with the sword. Wallahi, any person who, be careful, any person who says that, and you meet with a historian, Muslim or non-Muslim, or somebody who is educated in this area, they will laugh at you. They will laugh at you and mock you. But unfortunately, there's too many ignorant people out there. Those who read history, you will never find that Islam was spread through the sword. How could it be? It's, it's, it makes no sense. If you can't become a Muslim unless you really sincerely believe it from your heart, how can I force you into Islam? You're not a Muslim. In fact, you become more dangerous to me because I will think you're a Muslim, but in fact, you're just a hypocrite hiding and spying on me. You could harm me more than anyone else. So this notion is pathetic. Impossible. So having said this, the Prophet wasallam used to have a Jewish neighbor. You know how... You know, Muslims are about, you know, culturally we hate Jews and we mock Jews and, and things like that. Well, this is wrong. From, these are, comes from only ignorant people. Christians or Muslims or whoever they are. The Prophet ﷺ did not generalize and he treated every individual alone. He had a Jewish neighbor and the Prophet ﷺ used to experience some harm from him. So he used to place his rubbish in front of the Prophet ﷺ's house very frequently and the Prophet peace be upon him used to clean it up. One day or a few days passed one time there was no rubbish in front of the Prophet's house. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, understood that something's wrong with his neighbor. And Jibreel alayhi salam had told him to be dutiful to the neighbor to the point where the Prophet thought that Jibreel is about to tell him, and when you die, your neighbor has to take everything you have. The Prophet went and visited the Jewish man and he found him sick. The Jewish man asked, How did you know I was harmed? How did you know I was sick? The Prophet said to him, Well, the only way I knew is because of your rubbish. <laughs> That Jewish neighbor became a Muslim, ya akhwah. And he bared witness that he is the messenger of God. Our character. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa when he went into a battle, like fighting, when he was forced into fighting, 
He had to fight after 14 years of persecution. They forced him to fight them in a battle because if he didn't fight them back, they were going to kill him and the people with him. And I would like to make a little term understandable here. A lot of pe people think when they read verses in the Quran about fighting and battles and war, they think they read it wrong. When Allah SWT says, for example, قَاتِلُوهُمْ Fight them. They interpret it as saying, kill them, massacre them, attack them. قَاتِلُوا means to fight back. When someone fights you, you engage in fighting back. This is called qital. Mutual fighting. When someone, because Allah SWT says, do not attack. Allah does not like the people who attack. But qatilu, Meaning if they start you, then fight them back. Don't sit there and let them massacre you. Because then Islam will be stopped from spreading. And the weak people will be oppressed by these villains. These terrorists. Now, so the Prophet said when he went out to a battle, he used to stop his companions and give them a valuable lesson. And the battle was never ever practiced. No wars were practiced for 14 years. Does anyone know why? I would like to ask that question from anybody here in the audience. Does anyone know why? The major reason why 14 years battle was not commanded. That's number one. Allah subhanahu wa did not allow it. But I'm asking the reason why Allah did not allow it yet. Does anyone? Sorry? Okay, that's number one. To implement Tawheed, but still, they had Tawheed from the word go. There was something a little bit more than that within Tawheed, that comes with Tawheed. I'll give you a clue. Wars have conditions in Islam, don't they? And when you're in a battle, and people are charging, and you see your brother and your sister, your brother and your sister, and your father and your uncle bleeding to death, would you be in the right state of mind? Would you be able to respect the conditions of war? No. So now, does anyone still know why? The Sorry. Good try, brother, but I don't think that's the answer, insha'Allah. Jazakallah khair. Yes, brother. That's it. To fight only for the sake of Allah, in other words, to instill the etiquettes of manners and patience in their hearts. Because when you're out in battle, you have to respect the conditions of fighting. Abadan. One companion, he was out fighting the man, he was about to kill another man. And then the man struck him with his sword that hurt him. And I think that was Imam Ali radiallahu anhu. So then the companion lifted his sword up and this time he wanted to kill him with more aggression. Suddenly he stopped and walked away. He left him and he went away. The companions asked him, why did you leave him? He said, because before I was fighting in the cause of Allah and Allah only commands us in justice. But when he hit me and hurt me, I wanted to kill him out of revenge. But the Prophet ﷺ taught us for 14 years with practice so we may have manners of war. Which religion, which, which society has that as well. So he used to say to them, Behold, we have been sent a people to take the people from the worship of created things to the worship of the creator of all things and to save the people from injustice into the openness and mercy of Islam and to bring justice to the earth. Do not kill an old man of your, amongst your enemies if he is not fighting you. Do not kill a woman who is not fighting you. Wallahi, even if she is in the ranks of the enemies, do not kill a child. Do not cut off the branches of trees. Do not kill an animal. And do not ruin soil. And do not be excessive in killing. Do not mutilate the bodies. And look after the affairs and the conditions of war. And if you hold captives out of this war, then feed them from what you feed from your, fo your family. And treat them well as you would treat a guest. For they are your captives and you have power over them. And Allah does not like people who have oppression over the weak ones when they have power over them. They caught captives from the wars. Non-Muslims. Wallahi, not one captive was tortured in Islam in those days. And in the later years to come. And one particular companion, I forgot his name, the Prophet ﷺ brought him and tied him to the pillar of the mosque, of the Masjid al Madin, Masjid al Madina, Masjid al Rasul ﷺ, Masjid al Nabawi. And that's what he used to do with the captives tie them up, give them food. All the Muslims would come past, smile to him, treat him well, ask him if he needs anything. If he wants to bathe, they can bathe even, wallahi. They give him clothes. Just so that he can look and see how the Muslims live their life. Allah says in the Quran, and if an enemy non believer, comes to you to seek 
refuge. Meaning says, listen, you know, I've come to you without any harm. Allah says, then grant him security until he hears the words of Allah. That's all we want to do. We just want you to hear the words of Allah. And then you can go your own way. So he tied him up and they let him hear the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he would reject. Day by day reject. On the third day the Prophet ﷺ said to them, let him free and let him go back to his land. So the man went free and he left. They gave him a horse and he left. A few kilometers down, the man came back. He got off his horse and he said to him, I bear witness that, I, that there is only one God and you are his messenger. The Prophet ﷺ asked him, why didn't you embrace beforehand? He said, do you know what he said? He said, so that people will not think that I embraced Islam out of force because you held me captive. I wanted to embrace Islam to show the world that Islam is just and I became a Muslim out of my own will. Now, Prophet ﷺ was merciful at the day when he came back to Mecca. The first people who initiated the violence towards them and persecuted them and threw them out of their homes and exiled them, the Prophet ﷺ came back with a huge army and the Meccan people started looking at themselves and saying, what is Muhammad going to do with us? Some of them would say, he is going to kill our men and take our women. He is going to capture our children. He is going to take our homes and torture us. What's he going to do with us? The Prophet ﷺ entered and he said to all of his people, his companions, all of you, lower your swords. And then he called out. He gathered them and he said to them, مَا تَظُنُّونَ أَنِّي فَاعِلٍ بِكُمْ What do you think that I'm going to do with you? Amongst them was Hind, the one who killed the Prophet's uncle, uh, Hamza radiallahu anhu. When she killed him, the Prophet she, she opened his chest up and cut off his ears and his eyes and his ear and, and, and tried to eat his liver. The Prophet, when he saw him, he held tightly onto his back teeth and he, and he got teary. And when she became a Muslim, Prophet didn't even look at her or the other man, Hab, uh, Wahshi. But he didn't even harm. He said, What do you think I'm going to do with you? They said, we are at your mercy. The Prophet ﷺ said, اذهبوا فأنتم الطلقاء Go, for you are free people. And whoever enters their home, they are safe. Whoever enters the house of Abu Sufyan, radiallahu anhu, because Abu Sufyan, he had a leadership there, he liked being a leader, then he is safe. اذهبوا فأنتم الطلقاء That day, he won over all of the Meccans. All of them. And today we see how much Islam there is over there. The Prophet ﷺ was merciful towards the sinners and the ignorant, not like us. As soon as a person says uh, something wrong in Islam, we call him a kafir, a fasiq, a mu'afasid. Uh, uh, we call him names. An apostate, a rejecter of faith. Kill him, he ought to be killed. <laughs> Islam says so, and I bring you all the dalils, mashaAllah. But what they lack is understanding what the dalils mean. Inshallah, we've got a lot of scholars here. These days, not here, yani, and no, all over the world, unfortunately. The Prophet ﷺ used to treat the sinners and the ignorant people with too much kindness because he understood when a person doesn't know, then they ought to be taught. A person, a major sinner, came to the Prophet ﷺ saying, Ya Rasulullah, I committed a major, major sin. What should I do? The Prophet ﷺ said to him, Do you have a mother? He said, My mother is dead. Do you have a father? He said, My father is dead. He said to him, do you have an auntie? Meaning the mother's sister. That's who comes after the mother. He said, yes. He said, burraha. Go and be dutiful and kind to her and Allah will forgive your major sin. Look how much mercy the Prophet ﷺ has. He didn't tell him you ought to be stoned. No. Or that woman who came to Prophet ﷺ and said, Ya Rasulullah, I am pregnant from zina. Stone me. Subhanallah. He turned away from her the first time. Maybe she's drunk. Maybe she's ignorant. Giving her a chance to go away and repent to Allah in another way. So she returned back to him. Ya Rasulullah, I am a pregnant woman from zina. Tahirni, purify me. Stone me to death. The Prophet ﷺ turned again away from her. Trying to ignore her the third time. And then a fourth time. When she bared witness four times against herself and insisted, he said to her, Go back until you give birth to the baby that's in your stomach. What has he done? Why should he die with you? So she returned and in the hope, the Prophet is hoping that she will not return and ask Allah to pardon her and forgive her because Allah is merciful and to hide it. Nine months later she returned, ya akhwan. And she said to him, he is my child, now purify me. The Prophet looked and said, go back until the child has been 
until the child no longer needs your breast milk. He needs your breast milk. So she left and after two years, talking about two years and nine months, she returned back to the Prophet ﷺ. When Prophet ﷺ saw that she was insistive on it and she wanted the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they took her and she was stoned. And then the people, they thought, like, they, they felt like she's a bad woman. When the Prophet ﷺ saw this attitude, he stood up before everybody and made a legacy for her which lasts till today until the last hour. He said, Wallahi, laqad tabat hadihi al-mar'atu tawbatan law zana ahlu al-madina tila wasi'atum. Wallahi, this woman has repented such a repentance that if all the people of Medina were to commit the same zina and you were to place it on a scale, her repentance would have overcome them all. Not one of them will equal her. Abadan. Prophet ﷺ was merciful to all the people. What about the Bedouin man who entered the masjid one time when the Prophet ﷺ was sitting, the companions were around him. He felt like going to the toilets of the Bedouin, a rude man, and he doesn't understand. He went to one of the corners of the masjid and started to urinate. Just went to the corner and just began urinating in the middle of the, in the masjid. Well, the companions who were still not ready for that, they took out their swords. <laughs> <laughs> the Prophet ﷺ said, لا دعوه. No, 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 let him finish. <laughs> Allah, he said, let him finish, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When the man finished, he said, bring some water and clean it up. And he called the man aside. And he addressed him with such a kind manner that this Bedouin has never heard it from even his mother ever. How compassionate is the mother? He never even heard it from his mother. Finally, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said to him, and I can't describe the way he said it, he said, it is normal for a human being to need to urinate. But this place has not been set for such an act. The Bedouin looked up at him and cried. Bedouin doesn't cry, hardly cries. And said to him, Bi abi anta wa ummi ya Rasulullah. I sacrifice everything I have for you before my mother and father, a messenger of God. Subhanallah. Aisha radiallahu anha once questioned the Prophet She said to him, Ya Rasulullah, does Allah know all the secrets? Even, no matter, even if we, we spoke in secret? She actually didn't believe that Allah knows all the secrets. Aisha radiallahu anha. Now, wallahi, there's a true hadith. And the Prophet ﷺ didn't say, Kafarti ya Aisha, you're an apostate. How dare you say that? Allah knows all the secrets. No. He said to her, Naam ya Aisha. Yes. He's educating her. The Prophet ﷺ was so kind to the children. I'm sorry if I'm taking a bit of time, but I like to shorten the question and answer time because I don't really like them too much. Sorry to say that. I'd like to talk more about this a little bit more, insha'Allah. The Prophet ﷺ, he was so kind to the children, to his wives, and to the women in general. First, I begin with the children. Maybe you haven't heard this particular incident before. Wallahi, he really pleases me. A young boy, only about probably 11 or 12 years old, at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, he used to have a pet bird. What did he have? A pet bird. And he used to love this bird. And he called it a name. I think, I'm not sure, subhanAllah, I forgot the name. If someone can correct me. I think its name was... What was it? An nughair Jazakallah khair. The bird's name was an nughair Prophet ﷺ knew how the boy liked an nughair and Prophet ﷺ used to you know, share his, his joy with him. One day an nughair died, the bird died, and the boy was very sad. The Prophet ﷺ packed, put his clothes on, got up and headed towards the young boy. Where are you going, Ya Rasulullah? He said, I am going to, uh, to pass my condolences on to the boy and make him feel comfortable and happy because he lost a beloved of his. I just remembered my culture, the you know, Lebanese culture. If a boy was crying for his bird, they'd say, Get out of me, it's just a bird. <laughs> Kick it aside, put it in the rubbish, burn it. <laughs> you sook. That's what they would say. Okay, we have to wrap it up, inshallah, but I really would like to say this last thing because of Maghrib. Can I say this last thing, brother? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam one of the first things that he did and this is a message out to the people who say that Muslims mistreat their women 
and look at the women and females as a lower class than the men. I am talking about John Howard. <laughs> MashaAllah, he went to the extent of writing a book that Muslim men. I have to agree with him with one little tiny bit. And I'm not trying to be, save myself from anything here. Some Muslims, not because of their Islamic nature, it is because of their cultural nature, wherever they're from, wherever you're from. Cultural nature. My Arabic nature, for example. Yes, some of them, wallahi, are very, very wicked to their wives and very wicked to their daughters. And they mistreat the daughters and they favor the boy and they wish that the daughters were dead. Now, wallahi, this is true. So in a way, I don't blame John Howard. But I wish that he would have just asked for crying out, you're the Prime Minister of the country, you can enter any masjid you want, no one will kill you, don't worry. Just ask. Muslims are not known to do these things. So, one of the first things the Prophet ﷺ did was that he abolished the favorism of boys above girls. The Arabs in those days, they used to bury their daughters alive. They used to practice female infanticide. It's a criminal act of killing your baby daughter. And don't think that this act is not practiced today in some countries. I do not want to mention which countries as to not offend some people of that country who, are, who may be sitting here. But this is actually practiced, the killing of young females. Whether they are in the fetus or whether they are one year old or two years old, they kill them. They kill them, Wallahi al-Azim. Because they have a culture. And the culture is that the boy carries on the name of the family. And when a, when, a, when a woman gets married, she has to be a part of the husband's family. Whereas in Islam, the woman must keep her father's surname. Did you know that? When she gets married, like I'm Asad, my wife is Hablus, she still maintains her surname. Her father's name. Allah says in the Quran, Ud'uhum li abaihim. Call them by their father's names. This is most just in the eyes of God. Which religion has that? Which? Come on. Which system has that? Not one. To make her independent of her own name? The first thing he abolished was the burying of them alive. I will tell you this story. A man that existed amongst the companions, he used to, like, you'd see him talking normal and smiling or laughing. And then suddenly at occasions, he would start to cry and cry so much until he went unconscious. The companions told the Prophet ﷺ about this man to try and read on him for healing. So the Prophet ﷺ called this man and wanted to help him. He took him aside and he said, what, what, what happens to you, my brother? The man said to him, Ya Rasulullah, I was never going to tell anyone this, but now that you've asked me, I must tell you. Before I embraced Islam, I used to have a daughter. And when she was born, I wanted to bury her. Because the cultural ideology came into my mind. And I started to think that when she grows older, she will bring shame to my family. But I stopped myself. My heart for my daughter was overpowering me. Years and years went, par went by as I watched her grow. And then one day, when she reached close to a blossoming age, she was about to become a lady. He said, I began to have nightmares and desperation and distress. The pain of my culturalism came into me, thinking of the shame that my daughter is going to bring with me if she walked off with another fellow and brought shame to my, all my ancestors. Day by day, I wanted to do something, but then my heart, my love stopped me. Until one day, he said, I could not handle it anymore, Ya Rasulullah. I said to her mother, dress her up with, a, with neat clothes and comb her hair nicely and decorate her face and tell her your father today is taking you out to a party, a celebration, so that she can play with the other friends of hers. The mother knew that the father was up to a plot and a plan. So she dressed her daughter up. She combed her hair while she was crying. The mother was crying. 
And she powdered her face and made her nice while the mother was crying. And the daughter's asking, What's wrong, mother? And the mother would say, Nothing, daughter. She's not allowed. Otherwise, the husband will beat her. Or probably even kill her. The daughter said, Daddy's taking me out for a celebration. I love my dad. After, cele- after decorating her, the father came along in the evening. And he took his daughter. The wife grabbed, the prophet, grabbed her husband's hand and said to him, and whispered to him, but his daughter could hear. And she said some words that made his heart shiver and the, word, and the daughter to remember. لا تضيع الأمانة يا رجل O man, do not lose the trust. Your daughter is your trust. The man took his daughter away. And on his way, he's thinking to himself, what am I going to do? And the daughter is playing around her father, thinking that her father loves her. He said, I approached a very deep well which was steep and deep and it had rocks, sharp rocks at the bottom. He said, suddenly the pains and agonies of my culturism came and burnt me. And I began to think, should I throw her? Should I not throw her? So I would come close, then my heart would not let me. Suddenly the culturalism would come in. He said, I wrestled and wrestled. Suddenly, when I came close to the well, I grabbed my daughter and I threw her into the well. And my daughter held with her open, horrific eyes, looking at me and saying to me, Daddy, لا تضيع الأمانة. Oh, Dad, don't lose the trust. Don't lose the trust, Daddy. And the, Prophet, and the man then threw her into the well. He said, Ya Rasulullah, she kept falling, saying, La tudayya al-amana, ya, Rah- ya, Ras- ya Abi. La tudayya al-amana, until her tiny voice went away. And I couldn't hear her anymore, and she died, Ya Rasulullah. The Prophet ﷺ looked up at him, and his beard was soaked with tears. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet's beard was soaked with tears, and he said to him, If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was to allow me to punish anyone for the killing and murder of anyone before Islam, I would have started with you. I would have started with you. The Prophet ﷺ was the most compassionate, even to the women. And he used to say to them, Mahlam bil qawarir, take care of your precious pearls, your daughters and your wives. Stawsu bin nisa'i khayra. Have kindness towards your wives and be patient with them. Be patient with them for they make a lot of mistakes and you are not infallible. The Prophet ﷺ said, if you see a bad habit of hers, then remember the good things that she does and overcome that with that and forgive her for her ill comings. He also used to help his wives clean and sew and sometimes even cook Wallahi Al-Azim and look after the children when they were tired. Except when prayer came, Aisha said, it's as if the Prophet ﷺ didn't know us. He had to remember his Lord. The Prophet ﷺ used to, his first love was Khadija radiallahu anha. And she, he never got married to another woman until Khadija radiallahu anha died. But in her time he loved her the most. And after her he loved her the most. Until one time Aisha radiallahu anha saw the Prophet ﷺ sitting with an old woman. Old woman probably in her 70s. And he was talking and laughing. Like enjoying some stories. Just stories. And Aisha radiallahu anha got jealous. SubhanAllah she was very young. Got jealous of this old woman. So she came to the Prophet ﷺ and said to him, Ya Rasulullah, you know, Woman tilka al-ajuz. Who's that old woman? You know, old and she's young. That's what she's trying to say. The Prophet Sallallahu laughed and he said, so she was one of Sawahibatu Khadija. She was one of the friends of Khadija radiallahu anha, which brought an even heavier burden on Aisha radiallahu anha. What? He still remembers his wife and she's dead? He said, she said to him, a friend of Khadija's, he said, but didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you someone better? She means herself. <laughs> The Prophet ﷺ put a straight face on immediately. And he said to her, لا والله لم يبدلني الله خيرا منها By Allah, Allah did not replace Khadija radiallahu anha with anyone better than her. Which means you Aisha. For she is the one who gave victory to me when everyone else left me. She is the one who believed me when everyone else said I'm a liar. She is the one who clothed me and put the blanket on top of me when I was shivering and thinking that I had been hypnotized by some devil. And she said to me, you are a truthful man, an honest man who gives the poor and looks after the needy. Allah will not, never let you down. So she supported me when everyone else left me. And, to top the cake he said, and Allah gave me from her daughters and sons. Aisha I couldn't have any children. Aisha radiallahu anha understood her mistake and said, Ya Rasulullah, forgive me and ask Allah to forgive me. My brothers and sisters in Islam, I have run out of time. 
if you give me time in the questions and answers, I can answer why we love the Messenger وسلم, the most. As for now, I will leave you inshallah with that. Come back inshallah to hear the, the, the answer to that question. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.